a little extra each month. Why do? So the time of the story that I'm going to tell you today, by day I was a product manager for a software team in a bank. But by night, I'm a private investigator. And what is it I investigate? Ruby crimes. No, not jewel theft, the programming language. <coughs> and why did I decide to go into private investigating? Well, there's been rumors of a shady mastermind causing havoc and confusion amongst Ruby developers worldwide with this constant meddling in the source code. And I wanted to help her, stop to it. But I decided that I couldn't do this job under my normal name. I needed to protect my identity. And so I chose Deirdre Buck. D, for sure. Why? Well, for the sole purpose of making this joke. <laughs> And today I'm going to tell you about one of my more memorable cases. The case of the missing method. Chapter one. So I'm sitting alone, bored in my office, my flat, when the doorbell rings. And it's Mike. And he didn't look too happy. Let me tell you a bit more about Mike. So he was an acquaintance of mine. We had some mutual friends, saw each other out and about now and again. He was 24 years old, a junior Ruby developer, and he got excited about test-driven development. Now, he'd been applying for an apprenticeship at the prestigious Ruby Institute of Professionals. And he'd managed to get through all of the stages, feeding hundreds of applicants, and he was at the final stage, and this was happening in two days. And there were two people left fighting for this last spot, himself and a woman named Jenny. So Jenny was 27 years old, also a junior Ruby developer, and she loved all things Rails. She's also Mike's best friend and housemate. And they had quit their consulting jobs at the same time to enter into the world of tech. And not long after, they also decided to live together. <coughs> now for the interview, they'd agreed to work together to prepare so, so that they each had the best shot. May the best person win, they said. Now, they'd been asked to research a series of topics that they were going to be grilled on. And one of them was method lookup. And this had been assigned to Jenny. And this was the reason that Mike had come to me. Something doesn't add up in Jenny's notes, he said. But Jenny's been so stressed and panicked, rather uncharacteristically, by this interview that she just won't hear me out. She's convinced that she's right, and she says that they don't, and she says that they don't have time for Mike's doubts. And so Mike tells me that if I can help him find the answer to this mystery, he'll have what he needs to confidently correct Jenny's notes and save them from interview failure. So he reaches into the satchel and draws out some sheets of paper, and then Jenny's supposedly flawed notes. I ask him to walk me through them. So she's got these boxes to represent the concept of a Ruby object. And all of the objects have a label called class. This acts as a reference to the parent class of the object in question. So some objects are instance objects, and the class label for them refers to another Ruby object of type class. An object of type class has its own class label, and they also have a methods label, and this points to a table of all the methods that instances of that class can call. And then Jenny's written, any class you define is an instance of a class object called class. So, if we were to write class cake in our code, we're creating a class object named cake, and it's an instance of another class object, and the name of that object is class. So, all classes are of type class with a capital C. And then Jenny had this code in her notes. So, it was class cake, and there were two methods. One was an instance method called tasty, which returned true if the flavor of the cake was carrot. So, I immediately knew that Jenny was a smart woman. And then there was a class method called edible, which always returned true. <coughs> and then she wrote, imagine if we had a cake instance called carrot, then this is what the method lookup chain would look like. We'd have our Ruby object carrot, it would have its class label. This would point to another Ruby object of class cake. It would also have a class label. And there would be a methods label, which would have a table, and inside that table would be tasty because all instances of cake could call tasty. And then the class label for cake would point to a Ruby object called class, it would have a methods label, and that would point to a table with the entry edible. And then Jenny had written, 
A method definition always comes from an object's class. And at this point, Mike shook his head with frustration. It cannot be that the edible method lives on the parent class of all classes, he said. Can I show you something? Can I jump in your computer? I said, okay. So he goes over, opens up terminal, enters Pry, and he loads in the K class from Jenny's notes. So the first thing he does is prove that the class for K is indeed a class, and then he checks the instance methods for edible. Nothing. What a mystery. So I'm stumped. I'm not sure how to proceed. But Dee loves the challenge, and if anyone can solve this, then Dee can. And besides, this meant a lot to Mike, and he was prepared to pay me handsomely. <laughs> so I agreed to take on the case. Chapter 2. Ever heard of Google? Or, if you care about your privacy and people like me not spying on you, perhaps you use DuckDuckGo. Well, when I'm D, I I don't believe in these tools. I don't trust them. And it's no coincidence that with this approach, I've become the best Ruby PI that industry has to offer. And so what did I have? Books, 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 and more books. And I spent a whole day quickly skimming a load of books, but I couldn't find anything useful. So I thought, okay, let me form a hypothesis and go from there. I said that the edible method, while not in cake, must be somewhere in the ancestry tree. So what's the ancestry tree? Well, it shows all of the classes and modules that a class inherits from, so all the possible places a method could come from. And so I built up this where method, and it took two parameters, an object and a method. And so what it did was, it looked through the ancestors of an object's class, in order to find a class where the instance methods of that class and only that class included the method that I was looking for. And so first things first, I, first let me, I thought, let me check that this method works. So I created an instance of cake and I checked that I could find a tasty method in relation to it. Great, so it worked, cake. And now was the moment of truth. Where was the edible method? It had to be somewhere. What? Nowhere? No. <laughs> what a mystery. <laughs> and so at this point, I'm confused. And I think, OK, it's time for some fresh air and change of scenery. So I decide to head to my favorite co-working space. And here I feel at home. I'm surrounded by people hacking away. And I quickly settle down on desk. But given my naturally inquisitive nature, my eyes couldn't help but stray to the screen of the guy next to me. Now, he was an IRB and he was playing with something called object space. I said, what's that? It looks interesting. He said, well, it's a way that you can interact with all of the live objects within a Ruby session. For example, if you were to type this into your terminal, then you would count all the live class objects that you have in a Ruby session. I thought, okay, I've been working for a long time now. It's probably time to have a break. Let me have a play with this. So I go into ILB and I count up all the class objects. Nine hundred thirty-six. So I think, let me create a class and see that that number goes up by one. Nine hundred thirty-eight. That's strange. Let me try again. So 
I looked up and I saw the lecturer asking, well, what is the class of the class in small talk? And she had this color on the screen, and I hadn't been following. But she had this polygon object that she printed out, and she asked the system, what is the class of this polygon object? And it had returned polygon class. And then she said, well, what if we ask, what is the class of this polygon class? And it returned meta class. The class of a class is called a meta class, the lecturer reiterated. And she went on to say that all languages that Smalltalk has inspired have their own concept of meta classes. And this included Objective C, Java, Python, and Ruby. Something clicked. One class, two objects. And so I made my apologies to my soon to be no longer friend and rushed out the door home. So, first things first, I thought, let me try my luck. But of course, that would be too easy. So, I said, well, let me look at all the methods on Hake. I found this list rather overwhelming. So, I thought, okay, why don't I filter this down to all of the methods that include the word class? Okay, so this list was a lot more manageable, and two methods stood out for me. One of them was superclass, and the other one was singleton class. Next step, let me remind myself of the ancestry tree for cake, because I knew that the Edward method didn't live in any of these places. Now it was time to see what cake superclass returned. So I knew it wasn't the right answer because object was in the case class ancestry tree, and this was a subset. So now, let's see what singleton class gave me. Oh, this was different. And when I looked at the ancestry tree for cake singleton class, I saw three new objects that I hadn't seen before. Very interesting. And so I thought, let me go back to my where method. And instead of looking at objects classes ancestors, let me change it so that I looked at the ancestors of an object's singleton class, so I could search through the new classes that I just discovered. And then it was time to give it a go. Result. And I thought, wait, let me just check that what I think is happening is actually happening. And in my excitement, I forgot how to type, but I got there eventually. <laughs> And I confirmed that the Edible method was indeed living on Kate's singleton class. Case closed. Okay. Chapter four. So at this point, I'm delighted and I'm super excited to share this news with Mike. I also took a moment to wonder, maybe I should retire now. You know, this would prove to be one of the biggest successes of my career. And they always say that you should quit while you're ahead. Anyway, so I gave Mike a call and I say, hey, can I come down? I've solved a case. He's excited. He says, of course, come round, and I'll have the notes ready and waiting for you. But although I'd solved the case for Mike, I wasn't satisfied. I just discovered a whole new concept in the language that I hadn't heard of before. What are singleton classes? So instead of going directly to Mike's, I decided to take a detour to visit a friend of mine. Her name was Ellen. She was 43 a freelance developer, and she regularly contributed to the Ruby language code base. So I proceed to tell Ellen all about the case. And when I'm done, I ask her, so what are these singleton classes all about? And she says, well, they're hidden classes created internally behind the scenes in Ruby, and they're there to hold methods defined only for one particular object. So take your instance carrot of the cake class, its singleton class would hold methods specific only to carrot and not to another instance, say if you had one called red velvet or chocolate. Okay, I said, so given they are working away behind the scenes, when does knowing about them become useful? So I thought for a while and then she told me about one of her recent clients. And they were called Budgeting Inc. And they, they were creating a clever artificial intelligence, machine learning, personal finance tool for small business owners. And they were expanding globally and needed to roll out slightly unique versions of their software for each new city that they entered. So Ellen told me that when she first looked at the code base, she was horrified. Different developers had been responsible for each new city, and it looked as if they were trying out a new approach for naming things, testing things, designing interfaces. So there was a lot of duplication. 
And there was also, therefore, lots of wasted time on development because these developers were often reinventing the wheel and doing a bad job. And so there were lots of bugs. You know, some things had been copied, something had been left out, and it was just difficult to see what was important. The developers were unhappy because they had a lot of time to work and the cognitive load was high. And the product owner was also unhappy because delivery was either very slow or things were spun out quickly and then were therefore bug ridden. Ellen wasn't quite sure what to do. And then she decided to create a DSL, a domain specific language. And she asked me if I knew what she was talking about. It's a mystery to me, Ellen. You're going to have to explain it. So she said, let me show you a basic version. So she called me over to her computer, and, and she opened up a price session and input this class. So it was called City Instance. And it had a class method called Construct, which took a block. Then we had a variable called City, which called out to initialize via the new keyword. And then we called Instance of our on this City, passing in a block. And Ellen said, I should pay attention to this line, because it's going to prove to be important later. Then we returned City. We had an attribute reader called taxes, an initialized method, which set up an instance variable called taxes as an empty array. And then we had a method called tax, which took a name argument, and that added that tax to the taxes instance variable. Now it was time to give it a go. So Emma created a city called New York. And she added a couple of taxes. And then she printed out New York's taxes. And there we have it, said Ellen. That is a very simple DSL. And we can quickly spin up these lightweight city objects. Well, imagine if we had other properties, she said, like a list of banks or finance schemes. And imagine if we had more information about each of these properties. So maybe the taxes also had information about rates and thresholds. And so using this simple framework, it's not hard to imagine extending the city instance class to be able to create incrementally more complex city objects. Well, imagine taking that to the next level, said Helen. Imagine interacting with the city instance class in the same way on the command line, but instead of just creating variables in our price session, we're spinning up new subclasses of each city and other related models for each tax, scheme, bank, and then Ellen explains to me that this was the sort of thing that she produced for Budgeting Inc., a DSL that allowed for quick and easy scaffolding of each new city subclass and any related classes. Okay, she said, so now we know how to spin up identical city instances with different names and different taxes. But what about if one city had a quirk? So, since I was from the UK, she said, why don't we think about a place from the UK? So, I suggested Bath, since that was the scene of my first ever case. So she said, okay. So she created a city called Bath. She added a tax. And then she asked me to think of something that made people in the UK really unhappy. And she didn't like my suggestion. She thought it was too controversial. So she thought, well, let's go focus on the fact that it rains all the time. And when it does, the government clears everybody's taxes because they feel sorry for everyone. So we have Bath. We live in the taxes. And then it rains, and so the government calls a rainy day amnesty. And when we look at the taxes again, there's nothing there. Now, remember our friends in New York, said Ellen. Well, they've heard about this rainy day amnesty, and they want their own one. And so the next time it rains, they try and call one. But they get an undefined method. So city instance, and then there are all these characters. And then Ellen asks me, well, do you know what these characters are, what this object is? I said, no. And she said, well, look at this. And she called Singleton class on New York, and I saw that the objects were the same. So when we enter the realm of DSLs and we're calling methods like instance about, what we're doing is we're leveraging the existence of singleton classes. Because instance about stores any method declarations passed in via the block onto an object singleton class. But holding to that thought, said Ellen, I want to take a step back to the high level for a moment. So she said that by creating a DSL like this for her client, it enabled the developers to spin up each new city instance effortlessly. So she explains how she managed to abstract out all of the key similarities between any city. 
So now the developers had a frictionless way via the command line of spinning up the foundation that they needed. And so now the code base was better maintained because all of that scaffolding had been well tested and it had dealt with it once and none of the other developers now had to worry about it. In fact, they could now just focus on the interesting bits, which was the customization required for each new city. So the scope that they were dealing with was much more refined. So now the developers were happy because interacting with this system was a joy. It was easy to have a high level overview of the whole domain in their head purely by the documentation for the DSL. And the product owner was delighted also because there were far fewer bugs, faster delivery, and she, she could also speak in the same language that the developers were using by expressing new requirements by the terminology of this DSL. But, but let's go back to singleton classes again. So why is knowing about them useful? Well, she tells me that one of the main reasons that she was able to complete the project to a high standard was because she understood exactly where she was defining methods at any given point. Because once you enter the realm of dynamically creating classes and methods on singletons, as you saw in your investigations, the class hierarchy and method lookup gets far more interesting. And so you might be getting error messages, and you need to be able to spot where singleton methods are involved and where they're hiding, because it can save you from a lot of headache. But beware, said Ellen. I've been going on and on about DSLs, but they're not the answer to everything. So perhaps you have a case where you've got complex repeated business rules, and maybe you need to customize behavior in some specific instances. Then yes, you can consider DSLs as an option. But even then, approach with caution. But, as I said, you don't even need to be writing DSLs for it to be beneficial for you to understand the basics of how they work. So she said, if you're using Rails, you see DSLs every single day. She went over to her computer, went onto the Rails Guide website, and said, well, you know, when you're doing your active record migrations, and you're specifying your table names and how the format of all the columns, those are carried out via a DSL. And when you're specifying how your Rails app handles HTTP requests, that's also done via DSL. And I had just been doing this stuff by rote. I never stopped to think about what is actually happening behind the scenes every time I type the resources keyword into my config boots RB file. And there's more of these said that. So when people talk about Rails magic, she said, it's not really magic. It's more of a collection of well-written DSLs. And then Ellen looked at me and she said, I hope you're TDDing all of the time. And I said, of course. What do you take me for? <laughs> and she said, well, well, our spec with its described context of it blocks, those are all DSLs too. And so with all of these Rails and R spec DSLs, when you know about civil to classes, it can really help. Because you might find yourself in a tricky problem. You can't make head or tail of it, particularly if you inherit a code base. And so if you're seeing a funny bug to do with methods you never know, singleton classes might be the answer. And having them as part of your suite of debugging questions can be useful. So I was feeling really leveled up by the end of this conversation. And armed with this new knowledge, I headed over to Mike's. But when I arrived, I found that Mike who had tears in his eyes. He'd obviously been recently crying. And he had crumpled pieces of paper in his hand. And he raised his arm towards me, offering me these papers. And they looked exactly the same as the method look of notes of Jenny's that he brought to me the day before. So I took the notes from him and I looked through them and I couldn't see what was wrong. They looked exactly the same. So we had the carrot object with its class label, and that pointed to a cake object with its class label. It had the methods label. <coughs> with the table with tasty in it, and then we had the class object with its methods label and the edible entry. But wait, it, it didn't say class like last time. This time it said cake singleton. And as Mike saw me notice this difference, he fell to his knees and broke down in tears. <laughs> Jenny knew about singleton classes all along. He'd gone into her room to find the notes in advance of my arrival, and this was the copy that he found. Turns out that Jenny was so desperate to secure the job for herself that she had set out to intentionally mislead Mike in the hope that he would fail a whole section of the interview and therefore look underprepared. I was disappointed in myself. See, I've been so focused on the main villain, the shady mastermind, that I failed to spot a villain right under my nose. My best friend tried to sabotage me, Mike cried. And at this point, he started wailing, saying he wasn't going to go to the RIP interview tomorrow. And I said, nonsense, 
you can't give up now. So I crouched down next to him, I gave him a comforting pat on the shoulder, and I said, you can do this. And I have just the thing to help set you apart from Jenny. And he looked up at me, hopeful. Have you heard of Dear Self? I asked him. <laughs> and I proceeded to tell him everything that Ellen had just shared with me. And although Mike still looked devastated as I left him, I had confidence that I had inspired him with the power of singleton classes, that he'd put himself together and go and secure that RIP internship for himself. So it's two months later, and I managed to drag myself to a Ruby hack night. And I'm milling about, enjoying the free food and drink, when I hear a couple of people whispering in the corner. Oh, she's really famous, one of them said. And I look across the room, and who do I see? Ellen. So I walk over, we catch up, and I tell her that I've been reflecting on the case of the missing method and my takeaways. That there are singles in classes that are there to hold methods to fight for one particular object, and that when you understand them, it opens up a whole new world of Ruby, when you're dynamically creating classes and methods, and you're using more complex applications with things like dear cells. But, I said to Ellen, I still feel as if day to day I can get by ignoring them. So do I really have to care about them at all? Well, not really, said Ellen. Like you say, if you're using DSLs, then yes, you definitely should understand how they work. And they do underpin popular frameworks like Rails, but day to day, you can get by. However, she says, understanding why singleton classes are there, I think, is super interesting and empowering. Think of the Ruby core team. So they want to keep things as straightforward and as simple as possible. And by simple, that means minimize special cases. Aim for having one way, one pattern for explaining how anything works. So they're, they're continually asking, how consistent can we get things? And well, what's consistent in the realm of Ruby methods? Well, all methods in Ruby are defined in only one of two places, a normal class object or a singleton class. And every method in Ruby is really an instance method. And method lookup always starts with a singleton class. So what we call class methods don't really have any fundamentally different behavior. What they really are are instance methods, where the object in question is a class, and the method is stored on the class of singleton. So yeah, singleton classes are invisible, but they are everywhere. They're a fundamental part to how Ruby and its method lookup works. So I left the hack night deep in thought. And it had inspired me to explore more of Ruby behind the scenes, because there was so much here that I didn't know, and I had only scratched the surface. And I'd always been a general Ruby private investigator, and I'd been very successful in the field. But perhaps it was time to find a niche and reach the next level. Oh, <laughs> <laughs>